week and a little bit of this week in terms of the Torah portion. In last week's Torah portion, Sarah's years were numbered with the repeated use of the term years over and over in the numbering of how long she lived. And Rashi tells us that the repetition of the word years means for us to think about each of the phases of her life. We think about her life and not her death. And therefore, as we know, we have Parshat Chaye Sarah, the life of Sarah, or one could say, because Chayim is already plural, the lives of Sarah, or the life that is a composite of multiple parts of Sarah, even though it starts off with her death. So where it could be called the death of Sarah is called the lives of Sarah. The synchronicity of reading that parsha, being at this place where the Torah is rolled, and a recent book that came out about whether we remember the deaths of Jews or whether we remember the lives of Jews is poignant. This Sunday night at the Detroit uh, Jewish Book Festival, uh, I never know whether to say Ms. Darahorn or Dr. Darahorn, I'll say doctor. Dr. Darahorn will be presenting from her newest book, People Love Dead Jews. She's the author of six books, including numerous novels, including The World to Come, A Guide for the Perplexed and Eternal Life. She's the recipient of two National Jewish Book Awards, the Carnegie Medal of Excellence in Fiction. Her books have been selected by New York Times as notable, book list 25 best books of the decade, San Francisco's Chronicles best books of the year and have been translated into 11 languages. You may have, been read, you may have read her articles in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, The Atlantic and Tablet. She received her doctorate in comparative literature from Harvard University studying Yiddish and Hebrew. And she's taught at Yeshiva University and Harvard among other places. And so here her newest book arrives. People Love Dead Jews, finalist for the 2021 Kirkus Prize and Publishers Weekly's Best Books of 2021. In the book, she relates this experience of the public experience of Jews. She says the lives of Ashkenazic Jews were deeply immersed, and we're gonna just talk about Ashkenazim because that's where she's writing. We're deeply immersed in a culture of Yiddish literature, poetry, theater, memoir, and stories. And the Hebrew speaking culture infused similarly. And yet she found her, and she has written extensively about all of them, that's her field. Yet she found herself after the murder of the Jews at the Tree of Life Synagogue three years ago last week, that her fame came from being solicited by the major publications to write op-eds about the massacre. She is, she says, she became the go-to person to write about massacres of dead Jews then and afterwards. Her phone continues to ring off the hook every time there's an anti-Semitic attack. And she hesitated to write about it because she felt I, that, that's not where she's at. She celebrates the lives of Jews. She's not the eulogizer. She's not the one that teaches us how to respond to massacre and death. But then she thought, well, then they'll go to someone else who may write something that would annoy me or I disagree with. And so she accepted the offers and now she's the go-to op-ed person in the country every time there's an anti-Semitic attack. She writes that she didn't spend her life immersed in the understanding and articulating and renewing through her fiction, the lives of Jews, just to be part of filling the available space in the public sphere with the latest moralizing about their deaths. But she couldn't restrain, refrain from accepting, fearing that others would write those op-eds who had no knowledge of the lives of real Jews, but only knowledge of their deaths. Do we write about deaths, the death of Sarah, or do we write about the lives of Sarah? When she was contacted by Smithsonian Magazine to write a feature essay on Anne Frank, perhaps the most famous dead Jew in the world, she reflected on an incident that had taken place at the Anne Frank Museum. A Jewish worker at the museum had been told that he might not wear his kippah while at work unless it was hidden under a baseball cap. When he asked for a policy change, the board debated for four months. Dara wondered who it could be, how it could be that the board of the Anne Frank Museum could debate for four months whether to make a Jew hide their Jewishness. She also noted that in the Anne Frank Museum, 
one could take a self-guided audio tour in one's own language. And each audio unit had the name of the language with a country's flag next to it, except the Hebrew unit. There was no flag on that one. She further reflected and began to write about the thriving business of tourism to places that Jews were but aren't now. She reflected that her students and audiences could name four concentration camps, but not four Yiddish writers, despite the fact that 80% of the Shoah's victims were Yiddish speaking members of a profound and thriving culture that expressed and permeated their lives. She found that in our context today, people love to reflect on the meaning of the deaths of Jews, but not reflect on their lives. Hence the provocative title of her new book, People Love Dead Jews. People want, in my mind, they want the death of Sarah, not the lives of Sarah. She realized that the way the world thinks about it, dead Jews teach us about ourselves. They and the Holocaust have become a vital moral tale about our humanity, our struggles and redemption. Anne Frank is a Jewish girl, so much like the non-Jewish part of each of us, who is offering us grace from the grave, teaching us about kindness and optimism. But these stories cannot feature her or their Jewishness, only their common humanity. When they are like us, the morality tale works. When it is about them, where they differ from others, where they disagree with others, that ruins the identification. So our stories, our op-eds cannot be about them and their authentic lives. What is specific to them is distancing and threatening. She noted how in the op-eds and articles about anti-Semitic attacks as she did research for, she finally, she says, gave up and decided to write this book. She was reading op-eds that others wrote about the anti-Semitic attacks that go on in our country and in Europe. It was common to mention some problematic context that Jews had created in their communities if they weren't just like regular looking Americans. Articles about the gruesome machete attack at an ultra Orthodox Muncie party noted how there had been disagreements between the community and the local municipality over zoning laws. She wondered why that was relevant. Did articles about the El Paso hate crime against Latinos mention tensions about bilingual education in the community or articles about the anti-LGBTQ Pulse nightclub massacre mention a context of tensions? Why was it that if Jews looked alive in their Jewishness, um, if, if they didn't fit a mold non-Jews can project their own humanity onto, they somehow are creating a context or hate? So it needs to be the Jews are just like everybody else, which is why in many ways the Pittsburgh massacre was convenient so that we need to erase the difference. There were people like us handing out candy to kids who showed up. There was very little written about their actual Jewishness, why they came to shul, why that's important to them as Americans. For dead Jews to teach us about ourselves, we need to see ourselves in them, not them in them. We need to see the death of Sarah, not the lives. And we do this, of course, with black culture. This is me, not her. For a generation, we were comfortable with roots, with Rosa Parks, with the stories of martyrdom and bravery of Blacks. But how much did we really celebrate their lives and their voices, especially in their difference? I'm touched by the recent death of former professor of my department um, in my undergraduate institution, director of uh, Department of Religion, Albert Rabateau, recently passed away. And what he did in a very unpopular time of the 70s and 80s is he wrote books about the lives of the black church, of what people were praying, what people were thinking. The audience was small, but we were grateful. We do this with Muslims today, for example, in my opinion, to read a story about a Muslim going to the Islamic center, which happens to have a mosque in it, and they struggle the same as I do with my kids with their screen time, but they embrace American democracy, not like those Islamist ones, then it's okay. But what, if a Muslim going to the mosque says, I find a hollowness at the core of the American spirit. I worry I made a mistake by immigrating to America. What will my future generations be? Video game players and TikTok dancers, serfs to the moneyed and the privileged? What if I've come to believe that democracy seems to end up being that one's political voice is tied to how much money one can send to candidates, waft over their heads, and so the system might be inevitably unfair? 
What if they feel horror when gazing at the core of the American spirit? Is then it too Islamist? They are not enough like us. It's too specific, too Muslim, too much difference, even if I might share some of that belief. Remember, as Naomi Seidman has written, how Ali Wiesel's book Night was titled originally, and the world was silent when it was written in Yiddish. It was full of revenge fantasy and blame to the bystanders, particularly in France. But publishers pressured Wiesel translated into French to change its name to Night, to edit those sections and to make it a theological story. Where was God in the Holocaust? Why was it night, theologically? It wasn't the silence of the French audience of the book a decade after their collaboration that was to blame. It was God who was silent. And isn't that the story of humanity? All of us, we can all relate to. Where is God when the earth is being unin made uninhabitable by us? That book is more palatable than a book that blames us for despoiling the earth today. No one wants a sermon about our choices causing death and destruction ecologically. No one wants to be told maybe eating a burger is not a great idea, but a theological book that where is God when the, when the world is becoming uninhabitable? Professor Horn sees this at the core of the burgeoning tourist industry, as I mentioned. Signs and museums where Jews used to be and places that have no Jews left and nowhere is there any mention of why Jews are not there anymore. This Jewish family lived here. This is the old synagogue before it was repurposed, but no mention of why there are no Jews there. No mention that the townspeople gathered on the hillside nearby as spectators with their picnics to watch the Jews shot and buried in the gorge. It would be like an American town having tourism to a building where there once was a black business started up during reconstruction. This is my words, my, my comparison. With no reflection on how its owners and workers were intimidated and killed, other than that circumstances from outside took them away. Such celebrations of Jewish ghosts, therefore, like the book Night, serve a narrative in which there is no complicity in Jewish hatred and murder. And in fact, the celebration of the ghosts alleviates that anxiety. In this way, it supports a narrative we Jews often buy into as a price of admission into America, into assimilation. It's the narrative that somehow anti-Semitism is a Jewish problem. I recently got a call from a community member who told me that they had had an epiphany. The anti-Semites outside our door, they realized, I realized it's not a Beth Israel problem. It's a Jewish community problem. And I told them, as I've often said, and perhaps not explained, that it is not a Jewish problem, it's an Ann Arbor problem. To suggest that we must solve anti-Semitism is to imply, as Ms. Horn suggests, that if it is our job to solve it, then in some way we must have been in part to blame for it. It's the narrative that America loves dead Jews. Living Jews in their difference is the problem. Racism is not an issue for the black America to solve, perhaps by minimizing uncomfortable differences. Much easier to show my kids roots in an important and subtle way somehow makes me less racist than bringing black subjectivity alive in ways that make me uncomfortable. And here we have the parasha today in Toldot. Who even remembers the story of most of Isaac's life, which is one of passionately loving his wife and farming, farming and shepherding in Gerar? To do so may be to confront that the theme of that life was being constantly harassed and bullied by the locals and King Abimelech turning a blind eye and subtly blaming through the parasha Isaac for his own victimization. In fact, even when we read that story, we often wish to focus on blaming Isaac for lying about his wife being his sister rather than blaming the locals for the dangers of his not doing so. And finally, we must challenge ourselves as Jews. We have to be careful not to be overly celebrating the ghosts of the Jews and inviting them into our presence rather than their lives. I don't see a lot of interest in how a person like me, a conservative Jew who goes to synagogue, I think like people who went to the Tree of Life synagogue and whose culture speaks the language of my spirit and experience. But I mean, for me, the only way to, to really honor Nietzsche and Kierkegaard is to be a conservative Jew is to read Maimonides, and I combine the two, but people are like, eh, you know, that's dilettantism. 
or something. Real tradition, I don't want to hear how you, how you think non-fundamentalist traditional Judaism is the best philosophy applied to life that has ever been. But I will light a candle for you for the Shoah. We are right to honor our ancestors and inherited traditions, but we risk seeing our role as keeping company with our projection of the ghosts of our dead relatives. They are lighting candles in the imaginary shtetl, sitting down to the imaginary seder. But how about inviting them in as living spirits, as people a lot like us, trying to manage their personal lives and doubts, seeking inspiration, imbuing the best of their culture, questioning, using Judaism <clears throat> in new ways that broke with their ancestors, we often spend more time trying to pay homage to their deaths in our practices, living Judaism as our applied philosophy of life. We should invite in recognizing the uncomfortable places of difference and allowing ourselves to be different too. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.